Good morning and welcome to the Jump Weekly webinar. Uh, there's just Dave and I this week, <laughs> just us. So uh, Howard is at one of our clients' board meetings today and Paul is sailing somewhere on a on a large boat. So, um, so today you have the joy of just Dave and I. Um, so we're going to be talking today about individual performance versus team performance and how we can get good individual performance and good team performance and some debate about the difference between the two and how um, how we work on both of those. So um, because Howard's not here, we don't have any of the lovely statistics that Howard normally presents for us, but quite what statistics we would come up with for. I, I don't know what we'd have in, in statistics for this. Not sure. Um, as usual, we're recording this, and so it will be available uh, for anybody who wants to have a look at it or send it on to any of their teams afterwards. Um, and if you want to put any questions in the chat box for us about anything that we're talking about or anything at all about recruitment, we'd be more than happy, Dave and I, to uh, take your questions and uh, hear your comments on what we're talking about. So Howard has kindly given us a few questions to get us going. Good lad um, in his absence. So let's let's get the ball rolling, Dave. Yeah, yeah. And um, we often notice that high performing individuals have a different approach or outlook on things. But should their values and behaviors still align to the business values? I, yeah, absolutely. They, they, they should, because um, I think one of the issues that we all feel when we've run um, recruitment businesses or work for recruitment businesses is that often, often that the high performers can exhibit should we say different behaviors than sometimes we would want them to exhibit um because they're motivated or they're driven or they're different in some way at doing the job that they do but i would hope that intrinsically they would share the same values that the business lives by um because often the challenge is actually getting the business to live by its values not just an individual to live by the values that the business says it has to live by so you get a high performance i had a great high performing chap who was um <laughs> was it was a nightmare to, to to manage to lead um but he was brilliant at business clients adored him some of his staff less so but at his heart at his heart heather i think i could say that he shared the values of the business he was supportive he was kind um he was perhaps a little bit more fun than we would have wanted him to be but, <laughs> but that was my job and those are the managers to manage that but but i would hope that um even those high performers um dis display those values um because if they don't uh it, almost irrespective of how they perform then there are going to be issues for everybody else in the business if yeah. they seem to be getting away with something that is not concurrent with them um, with the way the business wants to behave yeah and, and i think it can undermine the values that you're trying to create in your organization and to encourage so if you're bringing in new people to the organization to you know ideally to create the next generation of high performers yes. and they see somebody who is not living your values being rewarded um, highly and praised um, and set up as an aspirational role model who doesn't live your values, then you undermine everything that you're trying to achieve. So I think it can be really counterproductive. So I think I think you're right. Fundamentally, you know, high performers can be challenging to manage, and that's sometimes why they're high performers. But you can have that high level of performance and that demand to be challenging to manage without undermining your values but it, it, sometimes it's a it's quite a fine line um, and it's quite challenging and sometimes high performing individuals become more powerful in the business than the managers yes so oh, you so. come across that so how do you approach that to make sure that your culture doesn't become toxic well i think i think um if they do become high performing uh, or, or so should we say more influencing than some of the managers there's two sides to that um, either the managers need to step up a bit more 
uh, and, and exert their managerial expertise and their leadership expertise, which is after all what they're being paid for. That includes managing high performing people, or there just needs to be a conversation to be had, which if everyone is sharing the values of the company, whatever they may, may be, hopefully one of those values, however it's communicated, is open and honest feedback and conversation. So that applies to the high performing individual and it also applies to the manager with whom she or he works for. So, uh, you know, you would hope there's a conversation. Um, I, I worked with um, a company as an advisor who, um, who let go of their highest billing high performer who was billing well in excess of £300,000 a year, was incredibly profitable for that company, um, had a significant number of contractors out, really good relationships with three clients, but was absolutely the wrong person for the culture that the business wanted to create. They had 15 staff at the time, so he was one fifteenth, um, but exhibited time and effort and just not a particularly pleasant person, to be fair. Um, and they took the very brave step of getting rid of him. And what happened, Heather, was that five other people beneath him who had been performing significantly poorly suddenly started performing much better. Yeah. Um, because this, this person wasn't there anymore to undermine them. Yeah. And it's a very dangerous place to be, isn't it, when you've got to make those really difficult decisions. But if you're high performers are taking power from your leadership as you say your managers and your leadership are effectively being undermined yes and so you have to question whether or not they're actually focusing on on being as good a performer as they could be if what they're doing is undermining your leaders and and taking power in the organization in a way that's not helpful so if by power, what we mean is that they're setting a great example um, and that, you know, that they're good for other people to see as aspirational, nothing wrong with that kind of thing. No, no. But if power is holding other people back or undermining people, then, um, and, and, you know, this is such a dangerous and slippery road. And I think it's one of the things that as leaders we have to take ownership for is sometimes letting people get away with behaviours um, that as leaders and managers, we should challenge more because their, their high performance is what gives them power. And so we're afraid of losing that high performance. And so we tolerate yeah. behaviours and power grabs and influence in the wrong way uh, in people where perhaps we should have more confidence in our ability to lead yeah. the organisation and, and challenge those behaviours. And it's such a slippery slope, isn't it? Such a thing. Uh, particularly for companies that, that we work with, Heather, because the more you tolerate that sort of um, errant behaviour, for want of a better word, that as you grow, as you scale, the more difficult it is to then challenge it as you get a bit, uh, as you get a bit bigger, because people will say, well, hold on, she got away with that and he got away with that. And even if it's a leadership, because high performers that may not just be salespeople at the desk, it could be one of the managers. Yeah, and it could be one of the support services team. You know, it's it's across the business. If they're allowed to get away with it for a long period of time without challenge, then um, then that becomes the culture, whether yeah. the leaders like it or not. Yeah, and it's about that consistency and belief in yourself and your business, and that belief that the values and the behaviours that you want in your organisation are right. Yes, and they are in the interest in yeah. your organisation, and you are right, and it you are entitled to hold people accountable for them um, and that the risk of not holding them accountable is worse than the potentially losing your high performer. Because the reality is if you challenge this stuff early yes, and it doesn't get to the point of escalating it out of control, you don't get to the point of having to lose somebody over it because part of your values generally will be about authentic, accountable, aligned uh, with the organization and working in support of the organization not just for themselves uh, and in the interest of themselves yeah. i think it's also important um, to find out what's behind that the way that they're behaving in that way 
because sometimes um, I've seen it where people have become high performers and on that journey to becoming high performers, their character has changed. Yes. And suddenly they are, they are the bee's knees, they're doing really, really well. And that nice, considered, competent person is suddenly now a superstar and they displays all the behaviours of a superstar. And it's important, I think, to then sit down with that person and say, well, hold on. Where, where have you come from? Who's this? <laughs> and then that's where some training and some development, some mentoring, whatever that may be. Um, but it's unique to that person. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't nip it in the bud, then the superstar status um, continues to grow. And, and sometimes I think in recruitment, we're responsible for creating those divas, right? We, you know, we, we lord performance, monetary performance, billings performance, to the exclusion of all else yes and and so we're not actually living our values and so we create those levers because yeah. we put them on a pedestal and is it any wonder that for those who are experiencing those high levels of earnings and that positive constant positive feedback that they sometimes do turn into divas you know we create our own monsters on yeah, yeah. occasion yeah. and then it's i think it's incumbent on all of us to, to say you know, what am I rewarding? Is it just billings? What am I shouting and celebrating about? Is it just billings? Or yeah. am I, by my behaviour, creating monsters? And in fact, what I could be doing is, is supporting and shouting about and celebrating those people who value, who celebrate and live our values as yeah. well as, the, obviously the billings are important and that's why we do it the way we do it. But it's that, for me, Dave, it's that, balance that we don't always get right um, and often we don't get it right either because there, there isn't perceived to be time to get it right because it's so fast isn't it our business moves at such a pace that you, you as we as leads have got to actually stop and say hold on we need to take a pause and we need to to address this and this is going to take a number of months and it may take some external help or it may take some coaching or whatever it is and that is an anathema sometimes when you're running at such a, a pace and you're growing. Yeah. Right, then you don't want to slow things down. Well, and, and we want to take the value of those high, the, the billing, right? We, you yeah. know, the billing. We need the high performers yeah. with the high billing. So the idea that we might, we might want to modify their behavior or their attitude in some and lose the billing <laughs> and lose, yeah, potentially lose the billings. I mean, the reality is you don't actually lose, no. lose the billings. I mean, I've got, the same sorts of things we had people that we allowed to behave as divas and when eventually they go or we let them go it's amazing actually how the team around them develop and grow in response to that that change um so in i can't think of a single instance of a, a very long career where we we didn't exit a a diva and it didn't turn out to be the best thing we ever yeah. did and that the, the team then grow to fill that space multiple times over yeah. um, so but it's like it's taking that big risky deep breath isn't it but yeah so so i think i think you're right we are very excited by the billings and so we think well you know let's just take the billings we haven't you know why would we take time out of our they billing why would we take time out of our billing lives to get them to change anything let's just leave them to get on with the billings that's fantastic but i think the reality is we're storing up problems for ourselves down the track things that could have been nipped in the bud yes we don't we don't address i i've been speaking with an organization recently um who are considering letting a very senior member of the team go um because they understood that all their business was concentrated in a very small number of clients and um so talked to this leader about broadening the, the client base and the client base has not been broadened so it stayed concentrated in a very small number and that very small number of clients are really struggling in the current environment oh. and so the billings in that this client have gone off a cliff right. and so the the response is now we're going to exit this very senior people because he didn't execute our strategy right. okay well, what did you reward him on yes what did you bonus him on what did you yeah. KPI him on right but they were very happy to keep taking the billings from that small number of clients 
instead of constantly being on his back saying, where's the extra clients? Actually yeah. not going to reward you on those clients anymore. We're only going to reward you on new ones that you yeah. bring in. And you can have some sort of legacy payment for what you've done. Yeah. I yeah. think added to that, Heather, the other bit, which we found with another individual a client I worked with, is that they were performing really well. They were well ahead of target, 100% plus, plus, plus. The clients didn't like him. Even though he was doing a really good job, the clients really didn't like him. He was finding the people, which of course is part of the job, <laughs> but actually the clients didn't like working with him and he was damaging the company's brand. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he was 170, 190% we... to target. He was earning really well. But the longer he was there, the more damage he was doing to it. But some of the leaders of the company were thinking, no, that's okay. He's doing great. Look at this. And yeah. then when he left, and he left, they didn't choose to get rid of him. He left. They went in to see the clients, and all the clients said, Oh, thank goodness for that. Thank yeah. goodness he's gone. How on earth did you put up with him? They didn't know. And it's it's um it's fascinating, isn't it, that we can become blinkered because we see the gloss of the billings and we lose that. And I think um Annette, you've made a very good point. Um Annette says, I think you have to take a holistic approach and take a more medium to long-term view rather than just focused on one or two yeah, yeah. top billings. <clears throat> the yeah. negative impact on the wider team is just not worth it. Toxic people are no good for the business or the clients or the candidates. Yeah. And that's yeah, you know that's so true um Annette. I think you're you're absolutely right. So if you're in that situation and you've got that, uh, that you've, you know, it's not been addressed or you've inherited, and you've got that toxic situation. What do you do about it? You know, Dave, what's the, what do you do? I, th I think as a leadership team, um, so if, you, if you're a company with, say, sub 20 people, you've probably got two, three, four as a leadership team. And possibly that individual isn't part of that because they're a billing consultant um, or they're working in another part of the business. I think as a leadership team, you have to come together and have a very honest conversation and go back to the root cause or the root of your business. Say, actually, what is our purpose? What are our values? What are we here for? What type of people are we trying to hire? Have that discussion, map that out in whatever way, and remind yourselves, because sometimes people have been running businesses for 15, 20 years. I go in and I'll say, what's your purpose? And I'll go, well, now that's an interesting question. <laughs> yeah, so you kind of go back to basics and then say, well, actually, this is why we started the business. This is what we, we, we say we do. This person isn't on the same page. We've got to remind them and bring them in. And it isn't a case of bringing them in and slapping them and saying, no, you can't do that anymore. It's a case of, actually, this is why, what, how we want you to behave. What can we do to support you yeah. to go from some of the behaviour that you didn't display a few years ago, but you do display now. Yeah. yeah. Um, and give them a chance to, to change and give them the right support to change. Um, and if they don't, then you do have that decision to take of, well, in my, in my life, I wouldn't, in my role, I wouldn't have tolerated it, so they would have gone. Yeah, yeah. And I think the holistic thing that Annette's talking about is really valid here. Um, you know, it's looking at it from all angles. Exiting somebody is not always the solution, or I don't think we should be afraid of that if that's the right thing to do for our business. Because as, as Dave and I have both said, we, we know that it ends up being the good decision. But you also, you know, can we just change the focus of the role? That individual that the clients all hated, but he was brilliant at the candidates, well, have somebody else do the client bit. Yeah, and then do the bit that they're really good of. Yeah. And you know, play to the individual strengths, bring somebody else in to do the bit. That way you get, you know, we can restructure roles. We've we have so much ability to restructure roles and to focus on particular pieces of it. And there's you know, 360 recruiters these days are of becoming less and less common. People are moving yeah. to 180 and 120 models all the time. And you know, that's an option to do with care to get somebody to, they can maintain their billings and their fantastic contribution, but you just stop them doing the bit that's causing you a problem. Um, yeah. But I think, I think you're right, it's about individual solutions and focusing on what's right for the business, as Annette says, holistically, not just being yeah. blinded by the billings. 
Yeah. Well, when I was um, I was running a small um, sort of thirty-person IT recruitment company in the city, and um, we had one. Um, she was a lady, excellent, excellent person, um, but just a nightmare in the office. <laughs> At, and this, these are the days where we were all in the office. Yeah. Um, and this is way, way, way before COVID. But our solution to her behaviour was we allowed her to work from home all the time, and she was much nicer. Uh, and her contribution to the wider team when she did come into the office was much better. And um, this is all before we knew that working from home was a thing. It, it was just like, actually, trailblazing. You were yeah, not very nice in the office, but at, at home, you could still do your job. It didn't affect her billings. Mm -hmm. She appreciated it. Everybody in the office appreciated it. We didn't have one person say, well, if Sun says allowed to work from home, I want to. They were like, they all oh, just breathe a sigh of relief. Yeah. 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 And then she would come in once a month, um, twice a month, probably. And it all, it all was fine. It wasn't perfect. That answer isn't the perfect answer, but it was a, it was a really good compromise. Yeah. And it worked for both parties. Yeah. And I um, don't know that she's still there now, but she was certainly still performing at a very, very good level for many, many, many years. Yeah. And, you know, it can be easy for people to say, well, just to exit the problem, right, just to exit the problem. But you, the reality is, if you're struggling, if your cash flow is not as good as it could be, yeah. you know, exiting a big biller is a big Listen. decision to take, right, a really big decision to take. So being able to have a few different options up your sleeve um, rather than the nuclear option. Because sometimes we don't, even though we know it's the right thing to do, it's going to take a little bit of time for it to become the right thing to do. You've got to have, especially in a small business, you've got to have modelled the cash flow applications before you take those really, really big decisions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I've got a lovely question that Howard's thrown in for us, uh, Dave, for your next one. Okay. So, do you think teams perform better when they have a mixture of solid performers with a sprinkling of high performers? or when the team is full of solid performers, but with a high performing manager? Oh, that's a good question, isn't it? Yeah, um, it's not the one I was expecting when I first read it. I, mean, I, I think I've seen that work equally well both ways, because to have a high performing manager, if she or he is quite an inspirational person, then the solid performers have got someone to look up to, to use that analogy, and, and I want a bit more, what, what, what is the secret sauce that they've got? What makes them as good as they are? I want a bit of that. I work for someone like that who I absolutely adored working for. And um, I never thought I would ever, I, I don't think I ever would, did become as good as they did, as they were. They were, they were fair, they were considerate, but they had great customer relationships. They got on well with everyone. They were really, really good models. And um, we had a team, there were about 10 of us, and we were all pretty average. You know, 100%, 110%, whatever, made trips, sometimes didn't make trips. You know, we were just good at what we did. We weren't brilliant, and we were absolutely not as good as, um, as this person was. And we did, we did all right. Um, there was no jealousy. There was none, uh, you know, and he got many rewards that we didn't, but we all thought he deserved it. Yeah, because because he was he was really good, and and he had that that secret sauce that I think a lot of recruiters sometimes miss. I was speaking at about it at an event yesterday. Um, he was likable and he was kind. Yeah, and we don't ever have those words. I don't see them very often on interview questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you kind of just want to say, "Oh, just be nice." Like, be nice always. We all have bad days, but just yeah. be a nice person. That will get you so much further yeah. with your colleagues, with customers, with the people that serve you and work for you, the people you're out with. Um, because there are still a fair few, sad to say, in our industry that do very well, but I would describe humbly as less than nice. <laughs> So, and there is, of course, a risk with you with your team of solid performers and then a high performing manager that if that high performing manager is ruthless and the reason he's high performing is because he's not kind, but he's absolutely ruthless or she focused on their own. Business, yeah. 
yeah to the expense of the team actually you're not getting the best from your team no. so that high performer you know it's back to that old argument about should we make all our high performers managers you know we keep promoting people when they do well to become managers when actually high performance on a desk uh, is not an indicator of the ability to manage a team. No. So, you know, the secret sauce, the gloss, the glitter might rub off on the team, but if it does, it will be kind of by accident. And, and sometimes we very often see that it actually holds back the teams. And so having somebody who is highly skilled as a manager and able to still be a high performing consultant, rarer than hen's teeth, right? Toughest yeah. job in the world. Yeah, being, it doesn't happen very often, does it? Uh, being a billing manager. I, I think there's a real risk of, if you've got your high performers who are ruthlessly high performance, that you hold back your team. And actually I'd rather have an average biller, but that who's a fabulous manager, who can turn a team of six good solid consultants into great, yeah consultants yeah by being that at desk coach with them at sharing sharing their knowledge and their skill and their ability and you create six high performance yes. for, from that and sometimes we don't appreciate how much time you need to give a high performer for them to create six high performers in their team and how we have to reward them differently yeah if we yeah. do that yeah, because I think why they selfishly focused on their own billings. Yeah. And I think sometimes, Heather, high performers can cast a shadow over the solid performers. And within the solid performers are some nuggets that you haven't yet been allowed to, to flourish because they're under the shadow of this, <laughs> this genius runaway uh, high performer. Um, and they're the ones who you've got to watch because they're in danger. They're the ones that could leave. Yes, exactly. You know, so they they haven't, they they haven't accelerated away and, and they could leave the company. And you're thinking, oh, no, we've lost a really good 110% or 100% or whatever, or however you define success, and because they haven't been able to move on. Yeah, and those people are the backbone of the organisation, right? They're the backbone of the success of our organisations. Yeah. yeah. So regardless of the kind of high-performing individuals or high-performing teams, what, what would you say, Dave, is the magic source? What's the essence of a high-performing culture that you know that enables you to create an environment where both can flourish where the good solid recruiters can come and do a good solid job and be the backbone of your business but then you also enable those high flyers to work within the team well, well it's interesting see, see my answer to this is a slightly um it's slightly driven by conversations we were having yesterday at the, at the talent event lunch where we were talking about automation and ai and the world of tech and um, I, I, I said that if you write into chat GPT, what can't you give me? How can't in H are we? <laughs> what, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. what can't you give me uh, in chat GPT? And the answer came up very simply. We did it together. Ethics, relationship, culture. How interesting. Chat GPT can't help you with any of that because that's not AI. And that's where high performing people perform best. If the culture is good, if the ethics of the organization are, are good and they've got strong customer relationships, people like them, they, they care about their candidates, they care about their, their customers. And that's the bit that you can't automate. You, know, you can't automate culture. You, you can't, we as, as recruiters, you know, there's, a, there's an argument, is it a science or is it an art? But what it is, is it's the ability to have those conversations. I remember when LinkedIn first came along 20 years ago and some, some, rather, um, some rather naughty clients would say to us as agents, oh, that's it, it's the death of the agency. Everybody's going to have access to everybody now. You're never going to survive. How many times have we heard, oh, yeah. that's the death and of And I the remember agency. saying, that's, that's fine. You try moving them. They're all there, but you try to get them out. You try to build a relationship. You try to understand culturally what's going on. And that's what high-performing people do. Yeah. And if they're in a culture that recognises that, then they're going to perform better, and therefore the company's going to do better. I love that answer. I really lo I love that answer. And it, it links into the whole automation, automation question as well, doesn't it? 
we can automate some of the routine stuff, but we should only be doing it if what it does is enable ethics, relationships, service, those things that, yeah. that aren't automatable. And that enables our recruiters to focus on the things that give us the edge. Yes. And, the, and actually the, those recruiters who become great rather than good are the ones who get that. Yeah. Yeah. Who understand that, who do that. Yeah. And, and rarely they'll say, Heather, rarely, I mean, sometimes maybe they do, but not always, will they say, I'm as good as I am because I've got the best tech. They'll say, I'm as good as I am because I understand what my clients want, because yeah. I understand what drives the, I understand what drives the candidates. I, 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 can, I can engage with a candidate and make him or her accept that this is a better job for them. Now, tech obviously helps them. We know that. I'm not decrying tech, but tech isn't the answer. No. It's relationship, it's culture, it's ethics, it's you know that that's that's where the that's the secret sauce bit for me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I, I I don't think I have anything to add to that at all. I think that's absolutely bang on. Uh, it's, it's a great question to do with clients. So it's a great question to do with your teams. For people watching this now, ask them what Chat GPT can't do because we're getting you know it's a new thing. It's six months old, and everybody's talking about it. But everybody's talking about what it can do. Very few people are talking about what it can't do. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? It's fascinating. I, I, I'd be interested in the chat, actually, if anybody's got any good experience of how they're using chat, GPT and AI. Um, and if you think it'd be useful for us to have, to do maybe a webinar in the future um, around the use of AI in recruitment, because I think there's there's more to come. But But you're right, it doesn't. You know, it's yet another thing that they said is going to end recruiting. Yeah, and I won't be there, Heather. I'll, I'll just provide an avatar of myself in blue. <laughs> we'll do the whole webinar with avatar. We'll do the whole thing as avatar. James yeah. Cameron can help me out. <laughs> so, um, so Howard's given me a great question that he wants the uh, audience to participate in. Okay. Uh, so everybody pay attention. Um, uh, oh, Annette, sorry, said that she started using uh, AI for blog content. Yeah, uh, it, it can be amazing, I think, for not for the final product, though, but it gives you something to then work on and build on. So it can save you huge amounts of time structuring yeah. stuff to get going. But then I think you need to, it looks like it's been created by AI if you don't add a layer on, on top. You've of got that. to add your human touch to it. We, we yeah. need to do the job. We, we have a combination of Pager and ChatGPT. And then we add our yeah. human bit. The secret. It doesn't look like everybody's the same as everybody else. Yeah. <clears throat> so Howard's question for the audience. So if you had an average manager and a high performing manager, and you have two teams, a poor performing team and a high performing team, which manager would you put with which team? So I'd love it if the audience could give me some answers in the chat. So you've got two managers, an average manager and a high performing manager. And then you've got two teams, a poor performing team and a high performing team. Which manager would you put with which team? Hmm. Howard's giving me what he thinks the answer is. Are we, are we allowed to answer? Am I allowed to answer? You are, yeah. What do you think? Because I think if I'm, anybody in the audience has it, a different It's much easier to get brilliant people to be better than it is to get average people to be better. Yeah, that's that's my experience. So if you've got somebody who does 120%, go back to just numbers, it's easier to get them to do 140 than it is to get somebody who's 70% to do to 80. So I would put a high performing person with a high performing team. But the underperforming manager, I wouldn't put with anybody. I'd spend time working on the underperforming manager to get him to be or her to be better as a manager and leave the team without a manager. So interestingly, those, those members of the uh, viewing audience uh, who've responded, and thank you very much for your response, but those have all said uh, strong manager with the poor team. So high performing manager with the poor team, which is opposite of what you're saying yeah. Dave. Yeah, so tell me why you why you think that because in my experience um high performing managers 
have the ability to make great people brilliant. Clearly, they have the ability to make less good people brilliant as well. But from a business point of view, you want as many great people being brilliant. Yeah. But you can't dismiss those that aren't. I just think that they then need a different type of, um, of, of leadership. Because what tends to happen often is the brilliant person, yeah, goes and makes safe, make up numbers, makes five people who are doing 70%, makes them to 90%. But yeah. from a business PL point of view, they could make the five people doing 120%, 160%. And yeah. from a company point of view, you've just generated a lot more cash, a lot more money, and you could hire somebody then to help work with the poor people, with, with, the, with the less good people, yeah. or develop the, the, some other managers, or find out whether there's a manager within that team that could step up and, and train her or him to make it. To make it better. I mean, there's no, there's no wrong or right answer. It's, yeah. it's, it's culture yeah. in what, what works for you. Yeah. So I've, I think, um, I think the um, the high performing manager with the poor team argument is a good one, which is we're bringing everybody up to average, right? Yeah. So we we're getting the poor team to be better than they were by putting a high performance manager. I think what you're saying is actually the ROI is better to have the high performing managers uh, time invested in making the high performers even better yeah. because that's easier and more rewarding to the business. So much bigger return for the business by yeah. making the great people even greater yeah. than it is trying to bring the poor up and that you, you don't ignore them, but no. You, no, no, no. You, you would spend some time developing the average manager to be a better manager to have a, an impact on the poor people but actually your business return comes from the great people being even greater yeah. bigger return on your investment and, and i think heather you've got to be of a certain size to have that problem yeah, most of us running businesses when i ran a business of 30 people i didn't have five geniuses <laughs> that <laughs> wanted to be even better i had mainly average people who i adored because they're the golden there you twenty percent less good, eighty sixty percent okay, and twenty percent brilliant. You yeah. can run a very very successful recruitment business if those are your ratios. Yeah, and rarely do you have twenty people of which ten are superb yeah. and ten are poor. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you, and there are some uh, some members of uh, of the audience are are agreeing with you, Dave. That actually, that you what you might do is you bring the high performing manager down if you put them with the poor team. And actually what you want to do is get that escalating excitement and growth going. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, there's some agreement for you. And, and incidentally, Howard, he, Howard at the bottom of my crib notes for today has given me a, uh, his response, which is he agrees with Dave too. <laughs> <laughs> so Howard absolutely believes that you put the best with the best to get better return. Um, and I think, it's, as you said, there's no right or wrong answer no. to this. Um, but it is really interesting to think about our propensity to want to get everything to average rather than yeah. take best to better. Yeah. Um, and, and so we sometimes our instincts, we have to fight our own instinct. Like, is it worth spending time on those people who aren't performing? Yeah. When actually there's a much bigger return from focusing on our attention on those that are and and getting them to be better we can get we them want, better we want to keep our people better. heather don't we because we you know, we're still in a time where it's so difficult to get good 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 people yeah. so having having a good level of average performers who fit culturally who have good relationships but they're just average and that's a horrible word isn't it but you know what i mean it's, they're just they're not over. stellar but they're doing a good job yeah, yeah. beautiful yeah love that Love those people. Yeah, we yeah. Have, oh, to have that problem. To yes, have because, a recruitment business full of... Yeah, yeah because there aren't those people out there. You know, for us, we can sit there and go, well, they're just an average Joe. Let's get rid of them. We'll go and find somebody better. Yeah, yeah good, luck. good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> most steady Eddie's. Yeah. Yeah. Steady Eddie's. Steady Eddie's. Steady Eddie's. Yeah, steady Eddie's. Yeah, well. steady Eddie's. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Well, if, as any, if anybody's got any questions for us to um, pop them in the chat or any other, uh, any other comments, I really appreciate the, um, 
the uh, interaction that we've had on this one is great um, to listen to. I think it's a, a fascinating debate in organisations and perhaps one of the extensions of it is about do we reward individual performance or do we reward team performance? Um, but I suspect, <coughs> unless you have an opinion about that, Dave, that's a whole webinar on its own is yeah. how do we yeah. set up reward schemes so that we are incentivising team yeah. behaviours if we want people to behave. And my one my one line answer to that in general is the average people want team and yeah. the very good people want individual rewards <laughs> because they can do really, really, really well and, and will accelerate. So um uh, so I'm it, it's gotta be what fits in your culture. Yeah. What is the culture of your company? What is the purpose? How do you engage with your customers? Uh, you know, because people behave like they're rewarded. Hmm. So if you want to reward high performance that is appreciated by both client, contractor, candidate and company, um, then then do, do, do that. Yeah. With that. But I wouldn't forget always to celebrate people who are living your values. Yes. Living your behaviours, not yeah. just people who are making you money. And, and don't, celebrate please, 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 don't just focus on people who carry a sales target. I was at a company um, not long ago where they were talking about how they they were going to do like a wheel, you know, on the wheel is a day off and with a day at a spa and all of this. Um, and I said, and that's for the whole company. And and their first response was, well, what are the people downstairs, how are they, how are they going to benefit from this? What do they give? To which, of course, I was in my kind way about to explode. <laughs> And so, all right, so nobody bothers collecting the cash. Nobody bothers with your website. Nobody keeps the IT running. Um, yes, but they, they, that's just a job. They, that's what they do. They, you know, it's like, okay, we have a, a lesson to learn here. So what we agreed was that everybody who doesn't carry that sales target still gets a free go at the wheel. Yeah. And I think that's... Oh, really just part of their reward is come up and join the sales team when they have the wheel and, you know, because they, they keep the company going. And I think that's really important because we do forget that, that the people that we've got supporting us are never going to get the same level of remuneration that the salespeople do, of that, you know, clearly, and that's right, and that's appropriate. But the other types of incentives that we run and the other celebrations about the other things are important. You know, those people who work in our support services reinforce our values and behaviours. Yeah. They work, they are often working with our clients yeah. You know, you're collecting cash, you are helping build the relationship that you have with your clients. You can absolutely undermine what you're trying to achieve as an organization. You haven't got your back office lined up. Yeah. So where you can be able to include them in some some of the incentives um, that are less to do with billings, absolutely 100 percent agree. So 100 percent agree. And, and certainly some of the people participating have definitely said that they do stuff in between the, the general individual incentives, fun stuff to include everybody. Um, and that's really good practice, really good practice to think about. So I, um, I hope you've enjoyed our little double act, a little bit different <laughs> from our, our normal <laughs> webinars. Next week, we're back to normal with uh, Hopefully, with uh, all of us on. I think, no, I think Paul is still rowing. I think Paul's gone to Tilbury <laughs> on a rowboat and he's rowing around Essex. Uh, he's going to tell us he's been yeah. on a Cunard liner somewhere in the Mediterranean. But I'm yeah, and he'll download some photographs to make it look like he's there. Yeah, he'll photoshopped. He's on a little rowboat. <laughs> Brilliant. So, thank you all very much uh, indeed for joining us, and hopefully, we'll see you all again next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Heather.